Today we're going to build an oversized chaise bench thing with a ton of storage in it and a concrete top. I'm for us. You can never really have enough storage or places for people to sit. That goes for pretty much anywhere in the house, but it's particularly true in the backyard. At least for us anyway. And that's pretty much the goal for this project. When it's finished, it's going to be able to hold about 20 cubic feet worth of kids toys, tarps, gardening equipment, and whatever else we want to throw in there. And it should seat six to eight people comfortably, depending on their size. So that would save even more space by cutting down on the need to store folding chairs for parties. Anyhow, so far I've been breaking down my plywood into their rough dimensions, which you can see right here. Once that was done, I could use my table saw to cut a series of rabbits in the two side pieces. This is pretty straightforward, just making a pair of cuts along each edge to clear out the material. But for the top and bottom pieces, which are really big, I couldn't do it on my table saw, so I decided to use my router instead. I started off by using the pieces that I'd already cut as a gauge to set the maximum plunge depth of the router. Then next, I used a scrap piece of plywood to mark the width that I wanted to cut the groove on the back of the piece. Then I took my router and lined the edge of the bit up with the line that I had just marked and traced the shape of the router's base plate. Then I just had to find the furthest point of that arc and made a line that went across the entire workpiece that same distance. Once the line was marked out, I needed a long straight edge, so I took a scrap piece of plywood and clamped it down. And then from there, it was really just a matter of taking several passes to create the rabbit. So this process is a little slower than using a table saw, but sometimes it's kind of your only option. And it's really just as accurate. Definitely dustier though. Once I had finished the top, I could do the exact same thing to the bottom panel. And I'll tell you. Nothing works up an appetite quite like some handheld routing does. So thank goodness there's Blue Apron. No, but seriously. I want to thank Blue Apron for sponsoring this video. And actually, before I go any further, I want to say that if you check out the link in the description box, you'll see that the first 50 people to sign up are going to get $50 off their first two weeks of Blue Apron. Okay, so if you're living under a rock and you've never heard of Blue Apron before, they're a service that delivers farm fresh ingredients to your door in exactly the right proportions so that you can create delicious chef designed recipes from home with no trips to the grocery store needed. They have plans that are designed to serve two people or four and prices start as low as $7.49 per serving. So I'll be honest, I had never tried Blue Apron until just last week. And I'm not exactly what I would call a great chef. I mean, I can find my way around the kitchen but they make it relatively simple to make meals that are way fancier than anything else I've ever cooked on my own. And they're just really good. Like, no kidding, I legit felt proud of myself while we were eating the pesto chicken calzones that we made. Also, with a new baby in the house, we've been admittedly pretty bad about eating out more than we'd like to. And this is a really convenient way to get home cooked meals without having to go to the store. And all while expanding our culinary horizons. So seriously, check them out. They're always adding new recipes and there's a bunch to choose from each week. Plus, since there's no commitment, you can skip or cancel any time. So, you got nothing to lose. Alright, thanks Blue Apron. Now let's get back to the build. The next thing I needed to do was cut a pair of grooves along the insides of the front of the top and bottom panels. These are eventually going to hold three sliding doors. And here you could use a router again with a smaller bit, but luckily my parents had stopped by, so I enlisted my dad to help me support the workpiece while I pushed it through. The trick for doing this is that you want to use two different blade height settings. Essentially, the top should be deeper than the bottom, so that it allows enough clearance that you can take the doors in and out easily. I know that might be a little hard to picture, so I'll put up a drawing that shows it to make it more clear. So with the four exterior pieces finished, I could start assembling things. After I had the bottom and two side pieces attached, I used one of the sides as a reference to determine how wide I should cut my vertical partition pieces. The next thing that I needed to cut was my back panel. 
I was running out of space and this thing was a little bit bigger than I felt comfortable moving on my own, so I decided to throw it up on some blocks so that I could rip the back panel to size. This meant that I had to make it out of two skinnier pieces, which wasn't ideal, but I just didn't want to stop working and nobody was around to help me move anything. Next I started making the doors by cutting down a sheet of quarter inch Baltic birch plywood. There's nothing really too tricky going on here, just basically cut them to the right width and then into three equal lengths. For the finger pool, I decided to go with a cutout circle. So to find the center of the panel, I used this straight edge that has regular marks on one side and a center scale along the other, which made doing it really quick. Then I just marked out the distance that I wanted them from the top and used a Forstner bit to actually make the cut. Later that night, I used three different colors of spray paint to paint each of the three doors. In total, I put on about three coats for each door, and the one that you're watching me do here is the first one, and I went a little bit too heavy, but putting on lighter coats seems to make it go on more evenly as you build them up. The next day I made the base. I started by ripping a bunch of strips into two inch wide pieces, and then I just cut them to length so that they'd end up where the cabinet would be overhanging by about two inches on each side. And you'll also notice that I'm making two bases here. The smaller one's going to be for the cabinet that I built in my last video, and this is going to help tie the two pieces together. And speaking of tying them together, the last thing that I wanted to do was make a little concrete top for that piece in a bluish color to aesthetically connect that piece to this one. To do that, I started off by building a melamine form, which is pretty straightforward. It's just five pieces that go together like this, and here you can see the interior dimensions, which will dictate the size of the finished slab. Next, you're going to want to apply a healthy coat of wax to your form. This isn't going to be for the concrete, but rather the next step, which is to apply silicone to all the interior corners. Right after I put the silicone in, I used a fondant modeling ball tool, I think that's what it's called, to create a round over area in all of the corners. We also wanted to play around with things a little, so we cut out these pieces of foamular using a hole cutting saw, and siliconed them in as well. And these are going to create little cup holders in the finish top. One tip that I'll remember to use for next time is to get a good layer of shellac or something else that'll make the foam watertight. We used wax, which worked okay, but not perfect. After a few hours, the silicone was dry and we could pull out all these extra little bits. And this is why you wanted that coating of wax. Otherwise, it would just be really tough to get this stuff out. So what you're watching here is literally my first time working with concrete, ever, like in my whole life. So we started out by weighing the amount of water and cement that we need for the form in separate buckets. Then in a third bucket, we started combining, always by adding the concrete to the water and kind of going back and forth till we had all of our dry in the bucket and we were shooting for a sort of pancake mix consistency. And we also used a little plasticizer to help with that. Next, we threw some blue pigment into the mix. And seeing this, I was afraid that it was a little bit too blue, like Smurf droppings or something. So we added just a little black and that really backed things off quite a bit. The last thing that we did to the mix before pouring it was add in alkaline resistant glass fiber. Not fiberglass, alkaline resistant glass fiber. And this is what's gonna give the slab its strength and why GFRC or glass fiber reinforced concrete can be as thin as three quarters of an inch thick and still plenty strong. And then we poured. Now, I know that all might seem like overkill, but part of the reason for doing this slab was really to get some hands-on experience before Mike from Industrial Maker and I got to work later that week on some pretty ambitious concrete projects, which you're gonna see on my channel in his next month. So make sure you're subscribed to both of us if you aren't already. The next night, because we couldn't contain ourselves, we pulled this guy out of the form and were pleasantly surprised by the color. I lovingly named it Periwinkle Well Barf. Seeing the patio area come together has me really excited to actually start using it. It even has my mind going about other possibilities for out there, like turning the whole space into some sort of second outdoor family room. I know that I definitely want to do a coffee table and a projector, but I might want to take it even further. I don't know. We'll see, I guess. And when I do figure it out, I promise, you'll be the first to know. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.